when Justice Scalia died, uh, finally there was an issue of substance injected into what has been an incra uh, incredibly crazy political uh, season. And I think it's terrific that our program today will give us some insight into the politics that are going on uh, as we speak, probably, and how this uh, appointment may wind up. So to introduce our guests, we have uh, some students. And the right is going first, Finn. Representing the right side of the argument is Sofia Suarez. Sofia graduated in 2014 from Miami University, where she ma majored in political science and minored in business law and modern languages. She's currently working as a research assistant for Professor Eleanor Fox and a teaching assistant for Dean Morrison at NYU. She's also the editor-in-chief for the Journal of Law and Liberty. And during the summer of 2015, Sophia was a summer associate at Cravath, Swain and Moore, one of the nation's top law firms, and she will be returning there this year to work in the litigation department. In 2017, Sophia will receive her Juris Doctorate from the NYU School of Law. Please join me in welcoming Sophia. I just wanted to start off by saying thank you for having me today. Um, when Professor Friedman first approached me about speaking today, I had two initial feelings. Um, the first was definitely excitement. So I think this is an incredibly important topic. I think that outside of the profession of law and law school, sometimes the Supreme Court you know, goes by the wayside and we spend all of our time talking about presidents and Congress and elections and the Supreme Court as you all know, is unelected, but they have probably the most profound impact on all of our daily lives, on our rights, on what the government can and can't do, um, that forms you know, the basis of, a lot of times, much more than you know, the president or Congress that's only there for a few years. Um, so I think it's really important that Friends Today is decided to have this conversation about the Supreme Court and filling the seat and my second feeling um, was a little panic. I realized, you know, for I think two reasons, the panic ensued for two reasons. The first, that I, I don't think this is the most popular view in the room today, the one that I am, the one that I'm presenting. But the second is, you know, even as a Republican, even as a conservative, I felt that it would be a struggle to find, you know, good, solid, persuasive arguments um, to present to you guys today. So I first, I ended up settling on, I think the narrative is really important. I think um, it's really important to give, to make sure that we all have a sense of what's going on in the background and that kind of influences and hopefully provides some kind of support to the position of the Republican Party on the right side. So Justice Scalia, it was and is an incredible icon, um, you know, apolitically and definitely first and foremost for conservative thought and the Republican Party. He has been on the court for, you know, over 20, was on the court for over 20 years. And ever since 1968, the court has been tilted. There's nine justices on the court and there are liberals and there are conservatives. And since 1968, the court has been five conservatives and four liberals. And now we have four conservatives and four liberals, and there's an open spot. After having control of you know, the highest court in the land, and like I've said, probably the most powerful institution that affects our daily lives, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the Republican Party and the GOP in Congress is making such a big deal about the appointment, the nomination of the next justice. Even though they've been you know, in some kind of control over the court for the past several, several decades, there are still a lot of issues that have not been resolved completely that are very near and dear to both sides of the aisle. Affirmative action, abortion, criminal justice, um, class actions, unions, healthcare most recently. And just because, you know, I feel like it's, it's 
reasonable to think that, well, it's, it's time for the tides to shift. We have a Democratic president. Um, there should be a liberal justice appointed, and it's time for the 5-4 to act the other way. And I think that's still a hard pill to swallow and them to just for them to just give up so easily. So the fight that we're seeing in the media right now and in Congress has ensued. And I think the leaders of the GOP, um, I think that in the media and out loud, they are definitely espousing or trying to espouse some legal footing and legal arguments to provide the basis for you know, the battle that they've decided to engage in, the war they've waged. But I think it really comes down to this is all political strategy. Um, I think, I hope, that the real goal behind all of this, for, for their sake, is that they're looking for a consensus candidate. They're trying to pressure the president into giving them, you know, the most moderate possible candidate, if not conservative, which is unlikely, but the most moderate candidate that he could possibly offer. And that would never happen had they just, you know, folded over and said, we will nominate, we will have hearings, we will consider confirmation. Especially when the last eight years, in both of President Obama's terms, the parties haven't been on the best of, of relations. So, you know, members of the GOP feel that President Obama has always tried to sidestep them and go through, you know, extra congressional means to overturn or not give effect to decisions that they've made. So they are of, or seem to be of the opinion, you know, to not give him an easy way to this ninth seat that's going to affect all of us far past both his term and the congressional senator and congressman's terms. So as a political strategy, this could totally fail. It can completely blow up in their faces. They could make this so difficult that he doesn't end up giving them a conservative or moderate candidate, that nobody gets confirmed, that they lose the White House and the Senate in our elections in November, and we get an even more liberal justice than could have ever been imagined. But I think that's the good fight that they're trying to fight right now. And I think you know arguments based on the Constitution or on history are probably a little weaker, but for some reason it's what we see in the media. Um, historically, this has happened. It's happened rarely because justices don't die often, A. And B, they realize that they realize you know, what's at stake when they resign. So they try to resign strategically during strategic times, not during election years, um, in order to give their president of their party the opportunity to nominate someone in line with their beliefs. But we can't expect that. We, can't, we don't know when it's coming. Um, so Justice Scalia passing has presented a unique situation in an election year. And, but I don't think that that truly changes things all that much. I think passing away in February with you know almost a full year left in the presidency isn't exactly the historical lame duck definition that we've had. So a lame duck president, for those of you that don't know, um, is a term we give to presidents typically from election, so November 2016 until inauguration in January. And the thought behind that is a new president has been elected so just because you, President Obama, or whoever it may be, are still in office, doesn't mean that you should be making decisions that really, truly affect us and our daily lives because we've already spoken at the ballot box and there's someone to replace you. I think a February open spot really pushes against that. So I don't know how strong the lame duck argument is. Um, but basically, I just want to leave you with, I think that it all makes sense on some basic level that this is a really momentous moment both for conservatives and liberals and in an election year and it shouldn't come as that big of a surprise that this situation has unfolded that they're you know giving the president a tough time what is rare is that they're not even willing to consider a nominee that is new um, the other side of that is well even if they considered one they have enough votes to filibuster and filibuster is they can pretty much talk the nomination to death and it will never go to a vote of the Senate. You only need, um, you need 60 votes to break a filibuster in the Senate. And there are 54 Republicans in the Senate currently. So more than enough um, to have a stronghold and be able to filibuster a nomination. 
So at the same time, you know, saying that they're unreasonable for not even considering a nominee may just be, may not really have any kind of effect because even if they did, it's unlikely, it's extremely unlikely that if it was a candidate that they weren't willing to consider initially, that the candidate would make it all the way through to appointment to begin with. So that's, that's my piece and I'll leave it to Professor Friedman. As a Democrat, it is my pleasure to introduce Barry Friedman. He's one of the country's leading authorities on constitutional law, criminal procedure, and the federal courts, all of which he has taught for the past 30 years. As the founding director of NYU Law's New Policing Project, he teaches government policing and regularly publishes in the nation's leading academic journals. He serves as a litigator and litigation consultant in federal and state courts has had a long involvement with social change issues. He graduated with honors from the University of Chicago and received his law degree magnum cum laude from Georgetown University Law Center. The author of the critically acclaimed The Will of the People, How Public Opinion Has Influenced the Supreme Court and Shaped the Meaning of the Constitution, he is currently writing a book on policing and the Constitution, tentatively titled Policing with Permission. Please welcome Professor Barry Friedman. Thank you. Thank you for having us all. Of course, you omitted the most important fact about me, which is that I have two children here at Friends Seminary. My son, Simon, is in the back, a third grader, and my daughter, who's in the sixth grade, uh, but couldn't come because she has too much work going on. Uh, so you can probably tell from Sophia's presentation that when we sat down to talk about this, we realized that even though she is a conservative Republican, she was not sure about her party's position in this. And even though I am a liberal Democrat, I... Uh, uh, do not take the strong liberal Democrat position. We've done our best job that we could to wedge ourselves apart, but I think she gave a very balanced and reasonable position. Uh, so there's not maybe a lot for me to say, but let me try to give you some background. So let me start with the Constitution, uh, because this debate as it's happened in the public has often been framed around what the Constitution says. And in particular, uh, you know, both sides are arguing that the Constitution resolves the issue in their favor. So what the Constitution says is that the president shall nominate, I'm sorry, uh, and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court. So he shall nominate. He doesn't have any choice. And in fact, if you go further down in that clause, it talks about con powers that Congress may exercise. So shall means shall. And it doesn't even make it wishy-washy in terms of Above in the same paragraph, it says he shall have the power to enter into treaties. He has some discretion. Here, there's no discretion at all. The Constitution is perfectly clear. He shall nominate. Now, just because he shall nominate, it doesn't say that the Senate has to actually confirm, and that is the problem. And as Sophia mentioned, there have been throughout history a number of nominations, and there have been a number of vacancies on the Supreme Court in election years, and they have largely been filled. Though you will also notice, if you look at a list, that they're going away. And the reason they're going away, as Sophia said, is the justices have figured out that if they retire during an election year, they may not get replaced or may not get replaced the way that they want to be replaced. And we get into this situation that we're in because, as again, Sophia said, you can't time when you die. And so that's where we are. The last election year nomination of a justice uh, the last vacancy that occurred during an election year was in 1968 when the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Earl Warren, a very liberal justice who led the longest streak of a liberal Supreme Court, retired in June. I don't know what he was thinking because Lyndon Johnson, the president, was already quite unpopular and Lyndon Johnson then nominated Abe Fortas, who was very unpopular in the Senate, and the Senate just filibustered the nomination. They refused to move it to the floor for a vote. And that was sufficiently cataclysmic that the, bell, the light went off in people's heads, you know, don't retire during an election year. But I'll point out that was June. It was a lot closer to an election than February, which would be almost a full year from when the new president would be inaugurated. But it's worse than that because of how the Supreme Court does its business. So the Supreme Court justices take their seats on the bench in October, the first Monday in October, 
and then they retire for the summer at the end of June, early July, when they finish deciding all their cases. And the way that it's sort of interesting and important to know this, the way that cases come to the Supreme Court is it takes four votes on the Supreme Court to agree to hear a case, but five votes on the Supreme Court to decide a case. So imagine that you're a justice and there's a case that comes to you about something you care about. What are you doing? You're thinking, are there gonna be five votes for my position? And if you can't count to five, you don't vote to take the case. And that process happens throughout the year, but mainly during the summer, right at the end of the summer, they sort of stock up on cases. Well, if we don't fill this position now, the Supreme Court will basically get nothing important done for two years, which some people think might be perfectly fine, but you take the point nonetheless, uh, because this court, this term's cases, we now have a Supreme Court that's four justices on the right and four justices on the left, and that means in many cases, they're just gonna split down the middle. And when they split down the middle, it doesn't decide anything. They uphold the decision from the court below, but there's no precedent. It doesn't have any effect anywhere else in the country. And if we don't fill the position now, if you're on the Supreme Court come the end of the summer when you're deciding what cases to take, you're not gonna take any important cases because you don't know who the fifth vote on the Supreme Court is. And so to not fill this seat now means for two years the Supreme Court will get basically no important business done. Now, I agree with Sophia that this is not largely a constitutional matter, it's political. And I agree that everybody's playing a political game. So what's Barack Obama gonna do? He's going to pick a nominee that embarrasses the Republicans the most. So for example, one of the judges that he's thinking of putting on the Supreme Court comes from Iowa, the home state of the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. He's trying to embarrass the chair of the Judiciary Committee into holding hearings and also knows that he will embolden opponents to Senator Grassley in the fall if he doesn't hold hearings. And the president will pick a nominee that will help the Democrats' chances in November generally. The Republicans, on the other hand, I agree with Sophia, are either trying to stop the whole thing, though, as she points out, it could backfire terribly because if a Democrat wins and the Democrats take the Senate, then without any doubt whatsoever, a liberal Democrat will take a seat on the Supreme Court and we will, for the first time in 50 years, have a liberal Supreme Court. My entire time as a lawyer, there's never been a liberal Supreme Court kind of gotten used to that. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I think what they're trying to do is push the president to pick somebody as conservative as possible to maybe get them through the Senate. For what it's worth, I think they've played a terrible strategy, simply as a matter of strategy. If I had been the majority leader of the Senate or the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee as a Republican, I would have gathered my people in a room and I would have said, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna slow this thing down. But I would not have come out in public and announced that there's no possible candidate that we would even consider. I just want to end, I think, by saying something that Sophia said, which is the court is incredibly important. It has this string of issues this term that are gonna probably get put over again until next term about abortion, affirmative action, workers' rights, uh, the ability of consumers to sue for things that have happened to them. Immigration is a big issue this term. Uh, and all of that is at stake with this seat, which is why people are so passionate and the last thing I want to say is just interesting, which is, so I think, you know, the Constitution is a pretty remarkable document. And one of the remarkable things about it is that it has stood the test of time. I mean, it's, it is, you know, remarkable that 250 more years in that we are, you know, still dealing with this document. But the framers made some mistakes. So, for example, one of the mistakes they made is in the Seventh Amendment, they put a dollar amount. You get a jury trial for any case over $20. Well, $20 was a lot of money back then, right? So, you know, unless you can sort of adjust the Constitution for present value, it doesn't make much sense today, which is why we figured out ways around the jury trial. Well, I think life tenure for judges and for Supreme Court justices in particular was a terrific mistake. At the time, people were appointed who were somewhat senior, and they held that office for their life, but it was not that long. And now we have justices that are on the court for 20, 30 years and that is a very long time to hold this position. And there have been many proposals floated by the left and the right to change that so that the Supreme Court justices served an 18 year term and so that they were staggered so that every two years we would have a vacancy and thus every president would have 
a couple of appointments to the Supreme Court, hoping to get around the sort of brouhaha that happens around appointments. But we haven't done that, and it probably will require changing the Constitution to do it. I guess we should take questions. Thank you. So any questions from the left or from the right? Or the center? Bob. Um, maybe both of you could clarify for us definitions that are um, very much in the AR. One is the word originalist for you and the word uh, the living constitution for you. Hello, it's on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, originalism. I, yeah, they turn it off for the Republican. Um, <laughs> so I assume um, that the, the question is coming, I think, because, you know, Justice Scalia especially and other conservative justices and very, very possibly one that would be appointed now, um, they tend to believe in this form of judicial interpretation. So, you know, when they look at a, at a, a, at a situation and they look at the Constitution, what, what is their driving, you know, analysis behind how they're gonna come out? And originalism is the idea that a judge frames his understanding of the Constitution and legal rules today um, by looking at what the framers thought. So they'll go back to either the time of the Constitution or the time that an amendment was, was passed um, to see what people at the time originally thought that was supposed to be. Um, the idea behind that is that we kind of lose, um, judges would, other judges would lose restraint and would go off on their own whims and their own values and impute them into the Constitution if they didn't look back and see what the people at the time were actually trying to achieve. What were the harms they were trying to address and what was the remedy that they thought was going to address that harm in order to restrain judges from imposing their own values on the Constitution and guiding them when making these decisions. So, you know, in 1987, a seat opened up on the Supreme Court and Ronald Reagan nominated Robert Bork for that seat. And there was a huge battle, the confirmation hearings, over how the Constitution should be interpreted. Nobody, dis the Democrats controlled the Senate. Nobody disagreed that Robert Bork was supremely qualified to sit on the Supreme Court. But he adopted this method of interpreting the Constitution and it led him to some very, very conservative results. And his nomination was rejected, and the second nominee was rejected. And it was only the third nominee, Anthony Kennedy, who happened to get confirmed in 1988, an election year. You know, what do the, what do the left think about the Constitution? I'm kind of an awkward person to ask. So the left talks about living constitutionalism. You know, Justice Scalia used to say that he was delighted that the Constitution was a dead document. And you might be aghast at thinking about that, but if you stop and think about what a Constitution is, it can't mean what everybody just wants it to mean now, then what's the point of having a constitution? The constitution is adopted to bind your hands. And the question is how far back do you bind them? And that's the originalist position. Well, the left's position for a long time was, no, 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 we have a living constitution. It lives and grows with the times. But the problem is, you know, what made the justices experts and what is the times? And so you need a method of interpreting the constitution that kind of mitigates between those two poles, which is what I think happens in most cases. They do look to what the idea was when it was adopted, they look to the history along the way, they look to the precedents, and they embed all of that in an interpretation of the Constitution that's slowly moving forward. Um, um, but, didn't the, like, the framers of the Constitution like, have the intent like, to create like, a living document? Like James Madison in the uh, Federalist Papers said the intent of the framers was not, for them, was not for the people 
who were interpreting the Constitution to follow the intent of what they meant at the time. So that's a great point. You know, the, a lot of the documents that are used now to interpret the Constitution weren't even public for at least 50 years after the birth of the Republic. So that's fair. Uh, and it's caused originalists to shift to a notion that you don't look to those framing area documents, the convention itself, but to common understandings at the time. But the framers acutely saw the problem. In fact, Jefferson thought that the Constitution should have to be revoted on every 20 years. They could see that it was going to age out. But again, I just repeat, you know, if the, so just think about it. If the Constitution means whatever you want it to mean right now, why can't a legislature do that? The entire idea of a Constitution is to bind us. And so at some level, a Constitution will always be somewhat conservative, only in the sense that it changes more slowly than society. And my own view, which is the subject of the book I wrote, is that uh, we're best off understanding the Constitution as putting into place the things that we come to believe are fundamental, which isn't just what we thought about today, but what we thought about over some period of time and by some supermajority of the country. I, I have a question, actually. Um, we've been talking a lot about gender, sexuality, and pronouns, and the Constitution assumes that the president is always going to be a man. And I wonder, is this, this issue of pronouns in constitutional law, are we just going to accept that, or will it perhaps be changed. So, do you mean whether we would change the pronouns in the Constitution, or whether they have like any kind of like legal effect right now? Um, no, will, will, will or should they be changed? I mean, that is something that is very real and alive in society uh, these days, and it's, it's kind of offensive, actually, even though it was written hundreds of years ago, that the assumption that the president should be a man is still in the Constitution. Right. Fully take that point. Um, I think the difficulty lies in the fact that the only way to change those words would be through the amendment process, unless I'm wrong, Professor Friedman. Um, and the amendment process is tough. I think they made it tough for a reason, because they did want the document to outlast them. Um, they want it to be a transcendent document. But with that comes some real issues. So I think three quarters of state legislatures or two thirds of the states um, have to get together and agree to make a change to the Constitution. So I think it's fully possible. I think that we're definitely in a time where a growing number of people would take offense to that. It's just a matter of are they going to mobilize and garner the votes necessary to make those changes. But it's possible. But if Hillary Clinton is elected president, um, and it says he shall, right. um, are, will, will the right take issue with that? I mean, if you're really, <laughs> really an originalist, uh, when she appoints someone to the court? So, I, think that I, don't, I think that there will definitely be some way out there falling off the right side individuals that may make those arguments. I would really hope to God that you know, to whatever higher power that mainstream Republicans and conservative thought would never take that approach, but one can only hope, right? We've seen some strange stuff. That's yeah. right. Oh, I, I have a question, which is th this presumption that we can change the Constitution if we need, if, if, uh, if we're not gonna take if we're forced to have a literalist point of view. But it seems like it's gotten harder and harder to change that constitution. My, when I was a young man, we were very active in trying to get the Equal Rights Amendment passed. And my political experience was one of great frustration. And I haven't seen very many changes to the constitution since in the 35 years since then. And is it really likely we, w we could change the Constitution to have term limits for Supreme Court justices, to abolish the irrational electoral college, and a variety of other irrationalities that we currently live by? So I'm just going to give fair warning, by the way, because I see the mics being passed around. So noting Bo's point about gender pronouns, when I teach, I pretty assiduously make sure that I call on people alternating uh, genders. And so if there are women in the room who have questions, then you might raise your hands, because we've heard from a number of men. So, uh, 
you know, it, I don't think it's gotten any harder to change the Constitution. It's always been incredibly difficult. And I think that was another big mistake, just like the mistake about life tenure. Uh, and there are some states that have kind of gone in the other direction. So it's very easy to change California's Constitution, but still harder than passing a bill. And that's the important point. And the sweet spot for this that most countries around the world have learned from watching us make this mistake is that you need to make it difficult to amend the Constitution, but not impossible. But the one thing I do want to stress is, you know, so we didn't adopt the Equal Rights Amendment. But the Supreme Court changed the meaning of the Constitution to achieve exactly the same thing. And so that's, I mean, that's why all this is such contested ground, because we have given it to the judges to decide what the meaning of the Constitution is, and they update it periodically. And the point of my book, The Will of the People, is to argue that actually, over time, the justices tend to follow public opinion, as they did with the ERA. Okay, one last question. There's a woman in the back with her hand up. Oh, he's just, point, just pointing to the man. So that, yeah. I'll ask a question. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what for the Republicans? What would be the? You know, you mentioned that if you were the leader of the Republican Party, you would try to uh, just slow it down quietly. Um, what exactly is the goal of? slowing it down? Is it, is it hoping that there's a uh, Republican president uh, in the next election and then that, does that, would that president then get to appoint the su Supreme uh, Court Justice or like are they just hoping that it'll just stay like neutral until then? So I think, um, I think that their expressed goal that they're, you know, saying in the media and in press releases is that you know we should leave it to the people at the ballot box in November, and I think that you know what they're saying is you know we can only hope that there's a Republican president in November, who will then fill the seat. I don't think that's their real goal. Um, I think the GOP is very split right now as to whether or not they are excited about their front runner, and I don't think they want to leave it to that chance. So I'm I'm of the belief that I think them you know, slowing it down is more just a battle against President Obama right now to get a more favorable candidate out of them, out of him than they otherwise would. What do you think? Well, so I think that's a little more optimistic than I am. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that we're gonna see a nomination uh, confirmed. I mean, you know, the question is how long that could go on. I mean, how long the fight could continue even past the election, but we'll just have to wait and see. I mean, I'm confident the president will nominate somebody right. and then we'll just see what happens. Okay, thanks to our guests. And to our introducers. And hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you.